and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. We are going through this series in First and Second Samuel called Rise and Fall. And we've seen that that's kind of the theme in First and Second Samuel as we look at God's first kings, uh, Saul and David, and Samuel's kind of the last of the judges, kind of the prophet of God. Uh, so we've talked a lot about public hunting, sort of like his public coronation, so to speak. And he was so kind of humble and scared, he was hiding in the equipment. And, um, <clears throat> but God said, you're the guy. God raised up Saul, and then he gave him this great victory over his army. God lifted up the lowly. But we see that very, very quickly, it all goes to Saul's head, and that God needs to humble the proud. And what we're going to be looking at today is Samuel chapter, primarily 13 through 15. And what we see is some crazy stories uh, amongst Saul and Samuel. You know, Saul's just had these great kind of military victories. Things are going well for him. The Philistines are still kind of pestering out, the, pestering them. And so what Samuel, a uh, God through Samuel, gives Saul an instruction. He says, go to this one place and wait seven days for me to get there, right? And then make a sacrifice to the Lord, and then we'll go to battle. So Saul listens to Samuel, Right? And that's what, uh, that's what Saul does. He, he gets to the place where he's supposed to be, and he waits seven days. But guess what the problem is? Samuel's not there. And Saul kind of looks around. He says, man, all, all my army is scattering. They're scattering all around. Like, uh, what am I going to do? Samuel's not there. He's waited seven days. So he says, you know what? I, I can solve this. I can fix this. He says, go ahead and bring the offerings here. Let me sacrifice the offerings here, and then, and then I know we're going to get the victory. And so right about the time he's sacrificing the offering, sure enough, Samuel shows up. And in verse 11, Samuel says, what have you done? And Saul's like, well, the people were scattering. Like, I had to take things into my own hands. Like, like my whole army was going to scatter. You're late, Samuel. It's your fault. And right, I'm trying to solve your problem. You should have been here earlier. So I forced the burnt offering myself. But Samuel, the prophet of God, looks at Saul and says, no, 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 no. You've done foolishly. You have not kept the command of the Lord your God with which he commanded you. He said, for then the Lord would have established your kingdom forever, but now your kingdom shall not continue. In other words, you're turning in on yourself rather than leaning in on God. You're trying to solve your problems yourself. You're not obeying his command. I mean, how often do we, do we fall into that trap? Right, where we, maybe, maybe it's like the army's scattering. I, I got to solve this one. Right, this is a big problem. I got to figure out how to solve it. And we think maybe we're even using God's name to solve it and help us, but really we're just serving our own agenda. And then everything falls apart. That's what Saul begins to experience as he leans in on himself. Kind of the next chapter, we get a, another story of Saul leaning in on himself. It's still the pesky Philistines are out there. And um, we, we find out that there's no blacksmith in Israel. So what does that mean? If there's no blacksmith in Israel, what does that mean? How, what quality of weapons do the Israelites have compared to the Philistines if they don't have a blacksmith? Pretty bad, right? right? They are so outgunned, so to speak, by the Philistines. And so Saul's looking at this situation saying, oh no, like, we better stay back. Right? We better hold off because there's, there's no, no blacksmith here. We don't have good weapons. Like, we need to stay back. But his son views it a different way. Jonathan is his son. And his son says, um, his son says, um, uh, his son says, um, you know what? If God's going to give us this victory, why don't we just go? God will give us the victory. And Saul's kind of like, no, 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 I need to stay back. And so Jonathan, his son, takes an armor bearer. One guy, like his assistant, his like chief of staff, so to speak. And he goes to the camp where the Philistines are. Meanwhile, Saul and the whole army is kind of holding back, and guess what happens? There's this great thunderous quake, right? There was a panic in the camp and the field among all the people. The garrison and even the raiders trembled. The earth quaked, and it became a very great panic. 
almost like, um, like in Jericho when the walls came tumbling down, God gave Jonathan the victory. So you have this difference where Saul is leaning in on himself and Jonathan is leaning in on the Lord and Jonathan gets that great victory. And then finally in the next chapter, we get our third kind of strange story in 1 Samuel chapter 15. And this one, in today's culture, we can get caught up on something, and we need to realize it was a different culture back then, because they weren't just dealing with the Philistines, they were dealing with the Amalekites, I believe. And, and the issue was, God gave them this command, he said, when you go to war with Amalek, uh, King Amalek, what you need to do is, if you have victory, destroy everybody. Destroy all the livestock, destroy the king, like, get rid of everybody. And, and, and to our Western ears, we're kind of like, oh, why would God say to do that? And if we get caught up on that, we kind of miss the point of the narrative here. Because what happens is Saul goes to war against the Amalekites, right? And he has this great victory. But what he chooses to do is save the best livestock basically for himself. And he's there in the process and he's celebrating this great victory. He's like, yes! And he goes to build a monument for himself. And Samuel comes looking for him. And he's not where he thinks Saul is going to be. And he, Samuel finally finds him. And basically, we find out that he set up a monument to himself about how great Saul is. And imagine this, right? There's this great monument to Saul kind of right behind him. Samuel, the prophet of God, comes up to Saul and is like, uh, oh, and, 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 and Saul sees Samuel. And Saul is excited that Samuel's there. He's like, hey, like we got this great victory. Look at this right? He says, blessed be you to the Lord. I have performed the commandment of the Lord. Look how great I did, right? Saul's like, look at how awesome I've been. Look at this monument I built to myself. And what was the command that God gave to Saul at this one? Kill all the livestock, right? Kill, kill everybody. The Amalekites were these, they were pretty horrible to God's people. And so God said, completely destroy them, and so you imagine this, there's this great monument of Saul there, and Saul's there all proud. Look what I've done for the Lord. And this is my favorite line in all of 1 Samuel. Maybe, maybe in the Bible, it, it, it's great. Sam, Samuel has kind of a sense of humor here. And Samuel says to Saul as he's celebrating his victory, what then is this? Is that bleeding of sheep in my ears and the lowing of oxen that I hear? Like what? Bah, like I, I don't even know what lowing of ox and moo or whatever that happens to be. Like, what, what's up with all the livestock? Saul is caught red-handed, right? He hadn't obeyed the Lord. He's caught red-handed, and guess what Saul does? He's like, oh, you don't understand Samuel. You see, we've, we brought him from the Amalekites. We're going to make a sacrifice to the Lord. Right, we're actually saving these to give a sacrifice to God. And, and by the way, it wasn't me. It was my men that did it. You know, they weren't listening. It wasn't me. I, I'm not the great one that just built the monument, right? It, it was my men, and they didn't listen. And, and really, we were just going to give a sacrifice to the Lord. And things kind of fall apart. And this is what, 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 uh, what, what Samuel says to Saul. He says, has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to listen than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of divination and presumption is as iniquity and idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected you from being king. And that's kind of sad, right? Saul, this guy that was leaning on God, it's all gone to his head, right? Where he's not listening to God and he's doing his own thing and he's basically using God's name to advance his own agenda. He's kind of being fickle, going back and forth. And when he's caught red-handed in his sin, what does he do? He tries to self-justify himself, right? He says, you know, no, 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 we were really just going to make a good offering to God. And then, and then he says, oh, by the way, it wasn't me. It was those guys. It was all my men. They weren't listening to God. It wasn't me. How often do we do that? Right? How often do we, do we think we're doing great things? 
We, we think we're maybe using God's name or misusing God's name to advance our own agenda. And when we get called out on it, we say, oh, no, 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 really, I'm, I'm doing this for the Lord. Right? I'm destroying these people. I'm, I'm doing it for the Lord. Or, or we say, you know, it, it wasn't me. It was those people over there or those people over there. They're, they're the ones that really did it. And because of that, God says to Saul, I have rejected you as king. And we get to the end of this section, and man, it's heartbreaking. Right? Saul has done wrong. Saul has served himself, and God very clearly says, I'm rejecting you as king. And I was thinking about that this week. I'm like, okay, here's the end of the story for the sermon this week, right? Thanks be to God. God's rejected you as king. Like, man, landing the plane there is kind of rough. I was like, so where, where's the hope in this? Right? Because we all do this. We all serve ourselves and use God's name to serve ourselves. I, when I read these stories, I see myself in these stories so many times. And what we see at the end of the story is God's rejected you as king. That's a scary place to be. And so I, I'm struggling with this sermon. I'm struggling. Like, where, where do we end? Where do we end on this? Like, oh gosh, there's no hope there. Like, what do we do? And so what I do is I, I listen a lot during the week to the scriptures. And, and for Samuel, I've been listening to like, I don't know, eight, ten chapters at a time over and over. Everywhere I drive, right, I'm listening to Samuel this week. And, 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 and as I was driving later on this week, something hit me before all of this happens. Before Saul doesn't listen and wait for Samuel, before Jonathan trusts in the Lord and Saul stays back because he doesn't have any blacksmiths, before uh, he doesn't obey the command of God against the Amalekites, Samuel issues his farewell address. And in his farewell address, he kind of warns them about the kings and everything that's going to happen, but he also reminds us about the goodness of our God. And this is what Samuel says, kind of knowing everything's going to come off the rails right before it does, way back in chapter 12. Samuel says to the people, do not be afraid. You have done all of this evil, yet do not turn aside from following the Lord, but serve the Lord with all your heart, and do not turn aside after empty things that cannot profit or deliver, for they are empty. And then I love this about our God. He says, For the Lord will not forsake his people, for his great name's sake, because it has pleased the Lord to make you a people for himself. God will not forsake his people. No matter how bad it gets, no matter how bad our sin gets, God will not forsake you. He will not forsake me. He will not forsake his people, for he desires to make you a people belonging to himself. And we see that's exactly what God does in Jesus. In a world where everybody is using religion to serve themselves, where they're misusing the name of God over and over and over, Jesus comes and he establishes a different kingdom, one of love and service and forgiveness, to love the very people that are going against him as he suffers and he dies. And the people's sins can't keep him down. Your and my selfishness can't keep Jesus down. He's raised three days later, and God desires to make you a people for himself. And we see that's what he's done for you and me. The Lord will not forsake you. So I don't know where you are today, right? Maybe you're on the way of like sort of crashing down from that prideful fall like Saul was, and that's a scary place to be. But if you're, if you're there, hear these words. For the Lord will not forsake his people for his name's sake, because it has pleased the Lord to make you a people for himself. God loves you. God cares for you. God has saved you. And you can freely rest in him, knowing that you don't have to make it right, that Jesus has already made it right. Or maybe today you're sitting there, you're sitting in the bottom of the pit, and you crashed and burned, you know, months or years ago. Well, know that God does not forsake his people. God desires to make you a people for himself, and Jesus has made things right for you, so rest in his arms knowing that he is making things right. For that's the nature of our God. When we mess up, when we go our way, God does not forsake you. God desires to make you a people for himself. And I think that's a good place to land the plane. So let's land there. 
God does not forsake you, for he desires to make you a people for himself. Amen. May the peace that passes all understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus to life everlasting.